Okay, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and good share. welcome to our Tanya class. And we are now at the beginning of chapter 8. So the last two chapters, al Rebbe was discussing with us the, um, the, <coughs> the three realms. One was Kedusha, the realm of holiness. And the two realms within Klippa, which are the Klippa's Nega, is the, the glowing Klippa, or the translucent Klippa, the Klippa that has the ability to shine a light through it, it can be elevated to holiness. Holiness can come through that Klippa, can pierce through. And then there's the totally unclean Klippas, which are bound, so to say, in the realm of the unholy, and it can never be elevated. We learned that at great length. Last week, we, uh, at the end of the chapter, we talked about different methods of if someone did engage in Klippas Nega, what happens? <coughs> so first he said that the, the three unclean Klippas cannot be elevated into the realm of holiness because it is bound there, it's tied there. It is from the three unclean Klippas that has no hope unless you do such a d- d- powerful tshuva that the tshuva is so strong that it can then transform and make from the wanton sins, the sins you did intentionally, they themselves should become uh, mitzvahs. But if you don't do that kind of tshuva, then you do regular tshuva, you will be forgiven but you will not rid yourself of that negative energy or that negative stain until Mashiach comes. <coughs> and then he said that there's other sins that if you do, that these, it requires a lesser tshuva to rid yourself of the unholiness that has attached itself. For example, by wasteful emissions. Uh, we talked about last week when someone is uh, there's a wasteful emission of semen that you can, you know, by, by the bedtime Shema, you have the ability to elevate it back from its terrible state, and that's because there was no female involved. But when there is a female involved, it was absorbed by, by the unholy, and that's a problem. Clear, yeah, and then we ended off the chapter by saying that if someone had an illicit relationship and a child was born from it, that's really a problem because now it is um, the, the the force and the life, the life force, I guess, of this bad thing has now been came down into this physical world into a human body of flesh and blood. So how do you get rid of that? So that's that's the worst form of illicit relationships where a child is born. So there are three levels. There's the child, there's an illicit relationship where a child is born from it. That's, that's, That's a situation you can never fix until the child dies, I guess. That person passes away and then it's no longer in this world. Another case is where there's an illicit relationship but no child was born, but there's a a man and a a woman involved. So that is very uh, problematic. And in order to elevate it from there, you have to do tshuva of the highest level that we said before, where a sin becomes a virtue. And then there's where there's no female involved, where it's just wasted emission, where there is a lesser degree of tshuva needed and that happens by the bedtime Shema, which has that spiritual power to get rid of the negative forces that have uh, been introduced because of that act. With that, we concluded chapter 7, and it uh, it elicited a quite a a passionate conversation about this topic. But we'll move on now, okay?
specifically that. What other what? That is not as bad because it's bad. Yeah, it is bad, but it's not a, a mamzer. It's not a. It's not a, a, a that comes from an illicit relationship. In other words, if it's at, if, if it's someone that you didn't marry, but you're allowed to marry that person, so it's a, it's a sin. It's not a good thing, but it's, this child is not an illegitimate child. That's not an illegitimate child. An illegitimate child is what it's a, it comes from either incest or adultery. Mm -hmm. That's what adultery is. Adultery yeah, is with, with a married woman. A married a man who has relations with a married woman. Yeah. No, that's not adultery. Just a young uh, unmarried man and an unmarried woman. What's the no? About married man and unmarried. That's not adultery. It's bad, but it's not adultery. No, but you, you commit it's not biblical adultery. It's, it's rabbinic adultery. Married. What? If a man is married and the woman is not married, that's not a that's not biblical adultery. That would be considered rabbinic adultery, because a man is allowed to marry more than one woman. You forgot that, huh? In the Torah, man is allowed to be married with more than one woman. A married man is allowed to, I'm allowed to get married to a wife and then a week later get married to someone else and have two wives. Yeah, sure. Not, not anymore, but that what, by biblical standards that is permitted. It's cold in here. Let's, let's turn it up. Let's turn it up. All right, this is... Not a yeah. They're not married. She's pregnant. They get married, and then the child is born. What about it? I don't know what the yeah, how that would work out. Well, maybe it's not. maybe it's a little bit better. I don't know. She's, uh, they live together. She's pregnant. They get married, and then they have a child. Well, that's that. This is not a class on on on, on uh, that kind of thing. But to <laughs> answer you briefly. To answer you briefly, it's probably I'm not sure if it's the same, but it's she got pregnant out of wedlock. But it's not a, it's not a, it's not that's not adultery. That's not a. Let's go for it. Chapter eight. Yeah. So, correct. Correct. Perikhas chapter eight. So we're talking about prohibited substances, right? We said before that if something that's prohibited comes from the realm of the th three unclean klipas, and they cannot be redeemed through holy acts, through doing it for a holy purpose. There is an additional aspect in the matter of forbidden foods. The reason they are called isur, chained, isur means prohibited, but it also means chained, like when you lock something up in a chain, with a chain. These foods are called chained, the reason is that even in the case of one who has unwittingly eaten a forbidden food intending it to give him strength to serve God by the energy of it, and he has moreover actually carried out his intention, having both studied and prayed with the energy of that food. So here's a scenario. A person is eating something, he has no idea that it is not kosher. He thinks it's kosher. And he's, and he's as a holy Jew, he's going to go and eat it, and he, he wouldn't eat something without a godly purpose. So he intends, he wants, the only reason he's eating what he thinks is kosher is because he wants to be healthy to serve God, so he can daven better and learn better. And in fact, he does that. He does learn better as a result, and he davens better, but he didn't know that what he ate was not kosher. So what happens? Having both, yet nevertheless, the vitality contained therein does not ascend and become clothed in the words of the Torah prayer, as is the case with permitted foods. When a Jew drinks coffee, a kosher coffee, or eats a, sh a kosher Danish, before davening in order to daven better, or eats a sandwich before learning so he can learn better, and the sandwich is a kosher sandwich, what happens? 
the life was that that food has within it <coughs> godly life force, sustaining life force, right? That that food becomes enclosed in the words of the Torah and the prayer that you're going to say as a result of eating that food. So when it's a kosher hamantash and a cup of coffee, it's no problem. On the contrary, it's a beautiful thing. You ate this hamantash, which is klipas neiga, and you set a brach on it with the intention that you'll eat it to give you strength to give a class or to learn a class. And you did that. So what happens to the life force of this hamantash? It went into my flesh, and that flesh now is giving me power. That's giving me life force to daven and to learn better. So in the words of the davening and in the words of the learning is included, this is enclosed, the life force of that food that I ate an hour ago. It, gets in, it becomes enclosed in the words of Torah and davening. That's the meaning of it. It becomes elevated to the realm of holiness. But what happens if this hamantash was not kosher? I think it's kosher. I didn't know it wasn't kosher. Someone brought it to me and I thought it was kosher. And I ate it with the abracha and I had an intention that I'm going to learn and daven with the strength I get from this. Does that strength and the life force of that non-kosher hamantash go now and become enclosed in the words of Torah and, and the davening that I'm now going to be able to do and I did as a result? The answer is no. The question is like this. When you eat a kosher piece of food with the intention to daven and learn as a result, it becomes... El no, it's not only no problem. It's a beautiful thing. The life force of that sandwich or the samantash that you ate becomes enclosed in the words of davening and tefillah, and, and tefillah right? So it becomes elevated into holiness. But what happens if by mistake an hour ago I ate a non-kosher sandwich? I thought it was kosher, but I ate a non with, and I ate it with the intention to learn better and to daven better. It should give me strength, right? I did it all. All was great. But then and now I find out after I finished learning and after I finished davening, I went through the whole thing. Someone tells me, oh, did you eat that sandwich? It wasn't kosher. And I find that it wasn't kosher. Whatever happened to it? So does the life force of that non-kosher sandwich that's in my flesh and blood now become enclosed within the, in the words of davening and learning and be therefore elevated into the realm of holiness? The answer is it doesn't. And that's what he's saying over here. Nevertheless, the vitality contained therein does not ascend and become clothed in the words of Tate and prayer or prayer, as is the case with permitted foods. And the reason is, he says, by reason of his being held captive in the power of the Sitra Achle and the three unclean clippers. What is this non kosher piece of food? The very life force of this thing, its very existence is the three, is the unholy clippers. That's its, that's its that's his definition. That's his identity. Its identity is the three unclean clippers. That's where it gets its life force from. For which reason it's permitted, prohibited, I'm sorry. So what do you think? You're going to take this and put it into your stomach and with the life force, this is stuck in the world of unholy clippers. That's his definition. That's his identity. It's unfixable. So you can learn from today till tomorrow with the strength of that cookie but it's not going to change the fact that it is this unclean clippers. You can't help that. This is so even when the prohibition is of rabbinic enactment. You may say that that may be only be one's a, a, a biblical enactment or a prohibition. What happens if it's only prohibited by the rabbinic stand, standard? It's the truth. Of, it's, it's true then too. For the words of the scribes are even more stringent than the words of the Torah and so forth. This is a very interesting concept. I want to elaborate on it for a minute. What? Say that? What's, what's the Alter Rebbe saying? He's saying a very interesting thing. What does it mean something is prohibited by rabbinic enactment? That means from the Torah's point of view, this comes from the realm of Klippas Nega, from the glowing Klippa. It's permitted. The Torah, consider, God considers it permitted. For thousands of years, that was a permitted substance. Means it was getting its life force from the, not from holiness, because it's not inherently holy, but it would receive this life force from where? From the klipa of the middle klipa, from the neutral klipa. Now come the rabbis in the Sanhedrin and decide that they're going to make this thing prohibited. Let me give you an example. I'll give you an example. What? 
chicken with milk. It's not in the Torah. You know. It's not only it's not in the Torah. According to the Torah, you're allowed to eat chicken with milk. And up to, let's say, 1800 years ago, that was permitted. So how long ago, so, so God created all this, 5,782 years ago, till 1800 years, is what? It's 4,000 years. For 4,000 years, it would, this was kind of, came from the realm of Klippa, Klippa's Nega, the neutral people. Mm-hmm. Come the rabbis, and what did they say? No, from now on, this is prohibited. And they made it a prohibited substance. Which means that not only they said this, stay away from this, they altered the very identity of this thing. Suddenly, from the minute that the rabbi stepped in and gave it its, its pro- pro- prohibited status, it changed the, the life force from where it comes. It starts now receiving its life force from the unholy clippers. You understand or not? They made it decide because they felt it was necessary. People were mixing milk, uh, meat, meat with milk as a result. They, they felt it was necessary. They were confusing chicken with meat, so they said everything is. Uh, that's the reason. Yeah. That's insightful to save you and me from mistakes. That's pretty insightful. What? It's not actually. It says that when the rabbi, the rabbi, God gave the Torah, they gave the rabbis the ability to legislate where they saw it fit and necessary. So he, he concurs with their decisions. And he says if the rabbis will prohibit something that I considered permitted and they will have good reason, I'm going to go along with it. And it will become permitted, prohibited, and it will be transferred into the realm of unholy clippers. Where does it say? In the Torah. Who, which rabbi is allowed to do it? The Sanhedrin. Yeah, yeah, it's in the Torah, in Deuteronomy, yeah. Yeah. No, it could be done after the Sanhedrin too. In other words, if the, the majority of the rabbis agree on a matter, that becomes law. The majority of the, of the, of the, the sages. I don't know. So today people don't, there's no more, people don't just, no, there's no more, not only Sanhedrin, in the time of the, of the, of the Gemara, there was also no more Sanhedrin. Time of the Talmud, of the, the later part of the Talmud, there was also no, no so Sanhedrin. So the laws of the Talmud are binding on everyone. Everything that was, uh, was legislated, everything that was decided in the Talmud, has been accepted by all the Jewish people and it's binding. Even though there was no Sanhedrin at the end of the Talmudic era. Now after that, you had situations where rabbinic rabbis of Ashkenazis, Ashkenazi communities ruled one way, whereas the rabbis of the Sephardi communities ruled a different way. A classic example is Rais on Pesach. The Sephardim considered it absolutely permitted and the Ashkenazim are considered absolutely prohibited. And they're both right. Because over here the rabbis prohibited it, and therefore God said, you listen. And where the rabbis didn't prohibit it, God said, you don't have to, there's no reason to prohibit it. That's the system of Torah. And Hashem goes along with the rabbis. He said that in the Torah, he said, I'm going to follow their majority rule. And they say something is prohibited, it's going to become prohibited for all of you. And then that prohibited substance will spiritually also change its dynamic. It will start receiving its life force from the realm of the unholy clippers. It goes into the realm of the unholy purely. No, no, they can't change, they can't permit something that the Torah prohibits. They can prohibit something the Torah permits. Yeah. You understand? So, that's what he's saying over here. 
If it comes to forbidden foods, even if you utilize it for a holy purpose, even if you utilize it for a holy purpose, it doesn't go that way. It doesn't become holy. It can't redeem it into the realm of holiness because it's stuck there, it's tied there, it's chained there. The Torah didn't say you can't. The, 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 whole, the whole prohibition of being secluded with a woman you're not allowed to be with is only rabbinic in nature. Yeah. yeah. But the, Torah, the rabbis do have the power to even permit something that the Torah prohibits, but only for a, for a, for a temper, as a temporary measure. The rabbis can say you can eat pig for a day. For tomorrow you can eat pig. If the whole Sanhedrin said to eat pig tomorrow, a novi, a prophet says to eat pig tomorrow for one day because we need it, you have to listen. If he says from now on pig is no longer prohibited, then you have to kill the prophet. <laughs> Serious. Then he's guilty of a capital crime. But if he says you should do it for one day, you listen. It happened actually in history. With Elio Hanavi, Elijah the prophet that we all love so much, he once permitted bringing sacrifices outside the temple, even though it was an absolute prohibition in the Torah to do that. He said, today we're going to do it because it was necessary. To, to prove the, uh, the, the, the false prophets wrong, the idol of pride. Yeah. The whole story, we read about it a few weeks ago in the Torah we read. But either way, so he says that the rabbis, this is even true, this is, even, this is so, even when the prohibition is a rabbinic enactment. For the words of the scribes are even more stringent than the words of the Torah and so forth. There has to be the majority of the rabbinic you have to get together and they have to decide on the matter. I can't, I'm not going to be, I don't have the power to just prohibit things. It's not such a no, today there's no such group. But there are individual rabbis that have a higher level of. No, not in this regard. No. There. Rabbis, as a group, decide on something that the, the, uh, the, the Lithuanian rabbi didn't agree with it. And, and would it be... Today it wouldn't become binding. If you want to listen, you listen. If you don't want, you don't. It's not, it doesn't become binding. Therefore, we continue also the evil impulse, the Yetzer Hora. And the force that strains after forbidden things is a demon of non-Jewish demons. Very interesting thing which is the evil impulse of the nations of the world, of the nations whose souls are derived from the three unclean clippers. Here's the question. It's an interesting thing over here. It's a very important point that the Al-Tarebbe makes here. Think about this. What did Al-Tarebbe say? Where is the origin of your animalistic soul, your human soul? Where does it come from? From... Uh, but which of the of within the other realm, the klipas neiga or the three un, the unclean klipas? Neiga, you're right. The Al Tareb in the first chapter said, if you remember, that the soul, the human soul of the Jew, comes from the klipas neiga. There's also good nature there. There's good and bad. It's a mixture of good and bad. So here's my question, yeah? The Jewish, no, not the Jewish soul, the human soul of the Jew. So it comes from the unclean klipas, for the most part. But some know, some come from the klipas, from the klipas nega as well. We learned that already. That so, there's, you know, for them it's some like this, some like that. So the question I have is like this. You have two souls, two drives. One drive comes from the holy, the godly soul. The other drive is from the klipas nega. Right, it, all its its natural knowledge and its natural identity is klipas neiga. Could it? So, so the question that Al Tareb is asking, is saying over here is, the question that is asked, how does a yid have? Could I? Let's fast. Not how, but let's ask. Could it possibly be 
that a Jew that has two drives, one drive is from the Klippas Neiga, and one drive is from the holiness, from holy, could it possibly be tempted to for something that comes from the totally unclean Klippas? Could a Jew who has no relation to the unclean Klippas, not his godly soul comes from there, not even his human soul comes from there, could he have a temptation that for something that comes from that realm that's totally unholy for, and, and, uh, where he himself has no such drive within him? How so? How is that possible? That's the question. We know, we know that we do. We know that we do. But, but, so, but how? That's the, the question is how is that possible? It doesn't make any sense. Could a human being be attracted to things that animals like? No. If he's normal, if he's a healthy human being. Do you have attractions to eat hay? Do you have such an attraction, such a temptation? A normal person, human being doesn't have because he's not an animal. So if he's not an animal, why would he have attractions, passions that animals have? He won't. He simply won't. So the question is, if a Jew's neshama and his human soul both don't have a relation to the realm of the unholy Klippas, where in the world does he get the temptation for that realm? What, what's driving him there? What's pulling him there? Nothing within him is pulling him there, so why is he being pulled over there? Where does he get that temptation from? Yitzhahara by a Jew is also from the, from the realm of Klippa. The most a Jew can, uh, can, can, can be tempted to do is something that the Klippas Nega is, 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 is pushing him to do. What's that? To do something permitted without a godly purpose, for selfish purposes. Okay, that I can understand. A Jew should have such a temptation, I get it. But where the heck does a Jew get a temptation to do something that's outright prohibited where he, and he has no connection to that realm? Where does he get that temptation from? The answer is, there's an answer for you. What's the answer? The answer is, now what happens when you do something, you eat a kosher cookie for your own pleasure, without a godly intent? What did we just say? You drag down the life force of that cookie for a, for a, for a, for a, for a certain time into the realm of the unholy Klippus, right? Until you do tshuva and you redeem it out of there. You could redeem it from there. That's to, because it's permitted. But for the time being, you dragged it down into the realm of unholy Klippus, right? Oh, so you have, so you, sometimes you, you, you yourself pull, get pulled in there. In other words, for the moment you took that neutral substance, because you had an intention that wasn't godly, so what did you end up doing? We said before, you can either pull it up or you can pull it down. So, but right now you pulled it down into the realm of the unholy. You're right, your soul doesn't have any relation to that realm. But because your soul, your human soul, got caught up with itself, and it ate and acted in a way that's only for selfish pleasures, what happens to the things that, ha that you just ate for selfish pleasures? For the moment you slept it down to the realm of the unholy creeper, so now you have, in that, in that process, you yourself start having a connection to that realm. You're schlepping things down to that realm. Even though your soul himself is not from that realm, but you're schlepping substances, and the life force of this substance that's now in me is schlepped down there for the, for the little while till I do tshuva. For that little while till you did tshuva, you, you got a little bit of a connection to the realm of the unholy klippus. And the more you introduce the unholy klippus into your system, you can start having a temptation to there as well. Yeah. But you start acting in an unholy way. But all of this. Often enough. Yeah. All of a sudden you open yourself up to much more. Yeah, that we, well, here's what happened. This is the realm of unholy Klippus. This is the realm of Klippus Nega, yeah? This is Klippus Nega, and this is Kedusha. So you have three realms over here, yeah? I come from these two realms. My two souls come from these two realms. I have no connection to this realm. And therefore, when you start out, you'll never have a temptation to something that's prohibited. 
You simply don't have that within you. You're not from that realm. But what happens? You start eating these cookies that are kosher, and you start realizing, you start enjoying them, you start liking them, you start becoming involved in pleasures of the permitted pleasures for your own for your own purposes. What happens? The, the life force of this cookie ends up in there for a minute, for an hour, for, for a day, for a week, for, hour, for, for a while. Then you drink this coffee for the same reason. The, the, the drink and the life force ended up over there for the time being, until you do tshuva. That means there's something in you that's now touching this, that's becoming involved over there. What happens when you touch dirt? You, it sticks to you. You start getting sticky. It starts getting sticky. And starts touch, attaching itself to you. Once you got a little taste of that, and you in that real, that realm has been introduced to you, even if it's against your nature, you suddenly start. Oh well, you know, there's, I'm, I'm related. It's starting, it's starting to creep its way into my system, and now you can even begin to start having a temptation to it. But what does Al Tareb call it? He calls it a non-Jewish demon. Look at the words over here. Therefore. Although the evil impulse, the Yetzirah and the force that strains after forbidden things is a demon of non-Jewish demon. In other words, you don't have such a demon. You don't have such a temptation for things that are unholy. You don't, simply don't have that within you. Which is the evil impulse of the nations whose souls are derived from the unholy, the unclean creepers. On the other hand, the evil impulse and the craving force after permissible things to satisfy an appetite is a demon of Jewish demon. That makes sense. That's a Yiddish Yitzhahara, as we call it. Because a Yid comes from that realm, the human soul of his comes from that realm, so he's going to have temptations for that realm. Good. That makes sense. That's a Jewish Yitzhahara. But, but, a, but a Goyish Yitzhahara is not really... The, how does a Jew get a Goyish Yitzhahara? A non-Jewish Yitzhahara... A three a, a unholy klipas yitzar. It's because you started out with becoming involved too much in your klipas neiga, and you dragged it down into unholy realm. So you started having a relationship with that realm. Suddenly it became more and more into you. You, you introduced more and more, and you now you even attempted. But so unholy, non non Jewish demons attach itself to you, but it's not natural to you. Yeah. What's reversible? You can get better and better, sure. But this is, this is the way that you should be introduced into... Unholy, real unholy. True, true unholy. You know, profound. Right. Yep. You hang around with animals too much, what happens? Mm -hmm. well, maybe you'll start eating hay once in a while. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, you know? Nevertheless, before it has to be reverted to holiness, it is, it, it is sitra achle, the unholy and klipa. And even afterwards, even after you brought it back out of the realm of unholiness, you brought it back into the realm of holiness, you did shuva, right? A trace of it remains attached to the body since from each item of food and drink are immediately formed blood and flesh of his flesh, what happens? You eat something, right away it becomes part of your flesh and blood before you did shuva. So right away a piece of your flesh and blood was from the realm of the unholy clippers, right? Because you ate it for a non-holy purpose and you dragged that down to the realm of unholy and that gave you life. And that became attached to your body. So although now you elevated it and you transferred it, tur turned it around, a trace of it remains there. That is why the body must undergo the purgatory of the grave. When you die, you have to go through what's called in Hebrew, chibut ha-kever, which means purgatory of the grave. What is purgatory of the grave? It's, the, it's some kind of spiritual purgatory where the malachim bang your body against it in its grave and it shakes you out and gets rid of all this negative, the, the dirt, so to say, some kind of spiritual thing like that. Chibut <laughs> ha-kever. 
in order to cleanse it and purify it of its uncleanness, which it had received from the enjoyment of mundane things and pleasures, which are derived from the uncleanness of the Klippas Nega and of the Jewish demons. Angels, yeah. You regret it. Huh? You regret that you did that. No, you 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 just tell Hashem, I'm sorry. You know, you have to say it with your word mouth, but huh? No, you say you say tachnun. You know what tachnun is? Yeah. Yeah. Just in case we sin. Sometimes you didn't. You're not conscious that you did a sin. Most of the day, we probably are conscious that we did a sin. Most of the days. Right, and well, that's something you didn't know. So you have to do tshuva for that too. But uh, yeah. still, you still have to do tshuva for it. Yeah, you, you, you repent for the for the sins you know you did and for the sins you don't know you did. And then every day? Oh, you mean the Al-Khat, yeah, yeah. You have to do that first. You're not going to be able to get forgiveness from Hashem if you didn't forgive, get forgiveness from the person you offended. Okay, that's different. So, so if someone died, for example, so you go to call them up, send them up. You don't even know where he is. So that's a problem. So you have to ask, you have to go in front of 10 people and ask forgiveness from them. Yeah. <laughs> Why? You offended someone in for grade school. <laughs> let's go further. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's move on, let's move on. Yeah. Only one who has derived no enjoyment from this world all his life as was the case with our saintly master, Rabbi Yehuda the Prince, is spared this chibut akever. Usually most people do get caught up with temptations in this world, even if they're permitted ones. And at least permitted ones, they do, they, you know, they enjoy it, and they like it, so they get, you know, so it's klipas noiga. So you got to go through the chibut akever, the purgatory of the grave, to cleanse yourself. Unless you're a person who never, ever enjoyed anything of this world. As Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, the author of the Mishnah, he, when he passed, before he passed away, he turned his ten fingers up to Hashem and he said, you know you're my witness. And nothing of me has ever enjoyed anything of this world, even though he was the richest man in his time. And it says that on his table there was everything you can find, any delicacy, everything, the winter, the summer, he was so rich that his tendons brought everything to the table, but he never enjoyed it. It was never him. It doesn't mean he didn't eat. He says, I didn't enjoy. He did it on purpose. He did what on purpose? No, I right, he wasn't, he had no enjoy. He took the, the, he was so holy that the pleasures of this world had no, he didn't feel the joy of this world at all. A person that doesn't have that, it doesn't have to, he has no stains on his soul. He has no stains on his body. He never introduced any of the klipas nega to his, to his realm. Was always all, was always elevated to holiness. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. He, he wrote the Mishnah. Yeah. Nobody else in history has ever. Yeah, there are others. Sure, there is. He's an example. And the Mishnah and the No, Mishnah Torah is the Rambam. Yeah. The oral Shura, yeah. He wasn't detached at all. It doesn't say he didn't eat. It says I didn't enjoy. No, but I'm saying detached from all materialism. 
material objects of the world, except for the fact that they were functional, or he raised them to only when he engaged with them. He had no personal pleasure from it at all. He took it was he he, he had I I read about him, it says in the commentary that he trained himself to such a degree that he felt no pleasure in anything. It was what, love? Do love? what do you mean love? What? He was wealthy. He was very wealthy. He he, on his table he had everything. No, he, he had on his table a lot of uh, wealth, uh, a lot of, uh, for whoever. That's a different pleasure. He's talking about the pleasure from this physical world. Sure, he enjoyed Hashem. If he loved his family? What about love from his family? Did he derive not as loving his Sure he did, yeah, that's godly. Yeah, he so took a lot of pleasure in his family. Felt left in this physical world for the purpose of physical pleasure. He had none at all. And there were others. Sure there were others. As for innocent idle chatter, now he's going to give an example of the realm of speech. Till now he was talking about eating, realm of action. Now he's talking about the realm of speech. What about someone that has that speaks idle chatter innocently. What does innocently mean? Because here's an interesting thing. According to the Torah, are you allowed to speak idle chatter? No, because you have to learn every three minutes. The problem is, what happens to someone that doesn't know how to learn? He's not, he doesn't have the wherewithal, the knowledge, the head, doesn't have the brains to learn. He's not, he's one of these ignoramuses. He, he's not stupid, but he doesn't know anything about Torah. So, how could he learn? So he doesn't have to learn. He doesn't. He's unable to learn. So he's not. So so for him, speaking idle chatter, as long as it's not bad, to, evil talk, that's permitted. Yeah. So as for innocent idle chatter, as such as in the case of an ignoramus who cannot study. So he has now st- stained on him also this problem, right? He has a lot of this. Every time you speak, there's a life force coming from the klipa. If it's not Torah, if it's not holy, there's, it is a life force of klipa within you now speaking, right? The, your, your mouth doesn't just move. It takes the life force to move from something, from somewhere. It comes from the realm of klipa. So that's the innocent idle chatter, as such as in the case of an ignoramus who can't study. He must undergo a cleansing of his soul and to rid it of the uncleanness of this klipa. Through the being, through its being rolled in the hollow of the sling. As is stated in the Zohar, Parshas Beshalach, page fifty-nine. What's the hollow of the sling? It's another form of ter- purgatory. It's where your soul is flung up and down, from heaven down to earth. What does it mean? The soul up there forgets what's God. There's no interest in the physical world, right? It's in the realm of godliness. It's, it's, it's zero interest in the physical. But when it was down here, what did it engage in? Football and baseball and steaks and, 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 and food and ice cream and, and movies and all kinds of things, the temptations of this world. And the soul, even though the soul itself had no interest in it, but because it was enclosed in the body, it had to go along with it. When you go to the movie theater, your soul's going with you. It's not like you're leaving your soul at home. It would be nice if we can say, you stay home and I'm going, right? But it doesn't work that way. The soul also goes with you. It has no choice. It's against its will. But because it's going and it's sitting there and there and there, so it, it, it gets knowledge of this physical world. So what happens? Now it goes up to the heaven. So the soul now is interested in the movie. Of course it's not. It wasn't interested even when it was down here. Certainly not when it's up there. And over there it has no connection to it. But because this soul now spoke in things that were idle chatter. This person spoke idle chatter, said the soul got stained by it. Right? Because he wasn't he couldn't blame him, he wasn't doing a sin. If he would be able to learn and he doesn't learn, that's a sin. But if he's an ignoramus, he doesn't know how to learn, so they can give him the license to speak idle chatter as long as he's not talking evil talk. But because it's to, uh, to satisfy his own temptations, like eating a pickle for no godly reason. 
for a humantash or a cookie, whatever you're doing. It's the same idea. And you're introducing that negative klipa into your soul, into your into your existence. So what happens? Yeah, I gotta get rid of that that that's vestige of not good, right? How does it happen? So it goes through a process called kafa kela. Kafa kela means the hollow of the sling. The, the sling. What happens is, the neshama goes up there, and it wants to have a connection to Hashem. It wants to bathe in the bliss of the radiance of God, right? What is the the, the, the malachim come and they fling the soul down to this world? Go go. You remember baseball? Go go go. Look at baseball. Go think about baseball. So it shuts, throws down the soul down to here to become once again attached to this physical world's nanishkai, to the silliness that he was engaged with when he was in this world. And that's a tremendous pain for the soul. Could you imagine this being flung down out of Gan Eden? Go, go, go. Away. You see that stake? Go. Yeah, go. Yeah. And the soul wants a stake then. He wants God. He's so one with God. And it throws it down to go. And that's a punishment, a form of punishment. But in that process, it gets rid of the... the, the, the cleanses the soul of this negative. Okay, so it's another form of purgatory. But with regard to forbidden, spe- forbidden speech, such as scoffing and slander and the like, which stem from the three completely unclean clippers, the hollow of the sling alone does not suffice to cleanse and remove the uncleanliness of the soul. But it must descend into Gehenna and purgatory itself. So too, he who is able to engage in this Torah, but occupies himself instead with frivolous things. So that's also what we say before. If he's occupying himself with idle chatter, frivolous things, it's somewhat okay only because he can't learn. But if someone does know how to learn and he does that, that's already a problem. So too, he who is able to engage in the study of Torah, in this Torah, but occupies himself instead with frivolous things, the hollow of his sling cannot self effectively scour and cleanse his soul. But severe penalties are meted out for neglect of the Torah in particular. For there you need even worse than purgatory, severe purgatory. Apart from the general retribution for the neglect of a positive commandment through indolence, namely in the purgatory of snow, as is explained elsewhere. Yeah. What's going on him? There's two types of purgatory. Purgatory of the fire and purgatory of the snow. These are all spiritual concepts, you understand? It's the, you have to strip it from its spiritual, from its physical uh, connotation. It's different forms of purgatory. One is worse than the other. So if you didn't shake a lulav on sukkis, you violated or you, how does he call it? Neglect, he neglected a Torah commandment. You didn't put on film, you didn't shake a lul of ansukas or whatever. Those are bad enough. You go to purgatory for that. But what happens if you neglect the Torah study? It's worse than every other positive commandment, even though Torah study is also a positive commandment, like shaking a lul of. But it's worse when you neglect Torah study, it has a more severe penalty than someone that violated or neglected uh, to fulfill tefillin or sukkah or whatever. Let's read this again. You didn't do it. You didn't do it. Not 24. If you have to go to work, you have to go to work. You have to go to sleep, you have to go to sleep. Whenever you could, when you're not working and you're not sleeping, you're not eating, and you're not doing things you have to do, and you're just sitting down and, you know, looking at, watching TV, watching TV for example, yeah. So it's better to learn when you, instead of watching TV. So is this a sin of omission? Yeah. So it becomes very tricky because, you see, if you could study Torah, so why'd you stop? So if you need to relax a little, that's fine. Yeah. If you got tired of learning and you needed to lay down and catch a few minutes of rest, that's not a problem. Some people do. Every day, every minute of the day. When you have free, every free minute. But we're not, uh, you know, we're regular people. We're that's not, uh, not, that's for different reasons. 
No, it's actually, yeah, I guess it's one of the reasons we can say, but it's not only, that, that's not the main reason. I think because it's a very negative thing. It has so much negative influences. That, that's why I avoid it. Not so much because I'm afraid to waste Torah time. I mean, it's not good to waste time in learning Torah, but it's not like because I don't watch Torah, I'm always with a book. That's not the case. But you watch the news. I do? Um, I'm not in my house, on my phone. <laughs> yeah, I hope you're right. It's not so simple. You can get carried away with the phone. You don't need a television today. Who needs a television today? I know that there are some rabbis that are like against the phone. Like I agree with you. I'm also why, horrified. Why by not enough. Why Same why thing. It's a waste of time. It's a terrible it's thing. A well, if you promote it, if you're using it to promote Judaism, that's a good thing. But if you're using it to uh, tell people what you had for breakfast, that's a waste of time. <laughs> for example, if you go on a trip to Habat We have what? You're going to trip to Habat to Israel. You're going to trip, you're going to the time. And then you post a picture of a group of people and here we are. beautiful thing. Huh? It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. yeah. Because you're going to Israel, you're going to holy places. Yeah. Oh, posting pictures. Oh, I didn't realize what you said. I didn't realize you meant. She said posting pictures like that. To post it on social media. So why, why what, well, what, First, you have to tell me why you're posting those pictures. Why, why did the person post them? Depends why he posted them. Why do you want people to know that you're there? If you want to show off, it's not good. So let me let me explain to you something interesting. We talk, we, uh, we we mentioned over here the purgatory of the snow. It says that for sins that were of, if you violated a uh, a negative commandment, you ate something that wasn't kosher. Yeah. You ate something that wasn't kosher. So you violated a negative. You lied. You you. Know, so there, what caused you to do that? The heat of the moment. You got excited about this piece of food. You really wanted it. You heat, yeah. You excited, yeah. So you, there's a, a, so what was attached to you? A burning clipper. A burning clipper. So how do you clean out a burning clipper? You got to burn the guy out. You got to burn it out, right? How do you clean certain stains? You got to put it in hot water, right? And you, you rub it out, and it goes away. What, 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 but the neglect of a, of a, of a positive commandment. Why, did you, why, did you, why didn't you eat in the sukkah? Why didn't you put on film? Eh, what's the film? I'm, I'm, you're cold towards the film. Right? It's not that you heat. Yeah, 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 the film doesn't mean anything to you. you it's, it's, you're cold towards it. By the negative command, you were heated up to eat that piece of meat. Over here, why do you neglect the mitzvah? Because you're cold to it. What's the sukkah? Who cares about a sukkah? It's a cold attitude towards it. For that, you have to clean them through snow. <laughs> so the purgatory of the snow is through cold. It's not as severe as the heat. It's different kinds of purgatory. Whatever these things mean spiritually, I'm not in that realm, but I can just tell you symbolically calls it snow because it's you're really trying to clean a person from a cold attitude when you're trying to clean a person from his attitude of coldness towards holiness I'm talking about the person's soul yeah 
So the, the, the reason he didn't put on film and he didn't dive in them he didn't, is because he's cold to these things. So you have to cleanse it through a cold purgatory. But when a person did something wrong, he sinned. Why did he sin? Don't eat that meat. No, I need that meat right now. I'm all excited about it. I must have it. I'm on fire for it. It comes from a certain heat, a certain excitement, a certain heat, hot, burning desire for it. So you have to burn out that burning desire for it. So that's the purgatory of the fire. Yeah. But, but even before you go to purgatory, yeah. is the shuba that you would do, for the cold, the cold? Yeah, that means you start doing the mitzvahs, yeah. No, tshuva is tshuva. You regret that you were cold and you start heating up towards it. You start getting excited about doing a positive mitzvah. You do a Shabbos, tefillin, sukkah, Pesach, whatever the mitzvah is. And tshuva for doing something wrong is the same idea. You stop doing something wrong. You stop doing it. You regret doing the wrong thing and you stop doing it. So the tshuva is the tshuva. I like that, huh? Yeah. Ah, yeah, so, uh, you're right. What? What's the question? The hollow of the sling. That's another form of tur- purgatory where they throw the soul down here to reintroduce it to the physical realm. Yeah? So the soul comes back down to earth as a reincarnation? No, no, no. It's not as a human being. It, 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 the a spiritual soul is introduced to the physical world. It reminds it of, not that it's flinging it down here, it's symbolic, but it reminds it, this malachim, the same angel, reminded of the silliness of this physical world. And it's such a distraction that the soul can't, it's very... That was an original person that died and then the soul went back out again. It came back down and reincarnated back into the No, 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 not reincarnation. I'm not talking about reincarnation. No, the soul, it, as it's a spiritual soul in heaven, is thrown down of a head to become reintroduced, not physically, but to see, to, 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 it, it, it throws it, so to say, it, it, re, it, it, it reminds it of the negative of this world. Of the, it stays as a soul. Stays as a soul, yeah. And soul in that, not in a body. And in that moment, it lost its godly presence and knowledge. Of yeah, and that's the pain that it undergoes, exactly. And there's no way to turn that into a holy soul. How long does it take? I don't know, up to a year. That's why you say Kaddish for a whole year. What? Purify the soul, yeah. Yeah. Because we don't, because it says that certain people go up very fast. Some people, the sinners, go for a whole year. How do you know you needed the extra month? I don't know. So you want your son to tell the whole world that my father needs an extra month? No, but I don't know. Let's say that a person that really needs He'll get it some other way. When? He'll get that extra month purgatory. It'll happen, but we don't say Kaddish because we don't want to say, announce to the whole world that my father needs 12 months. He's the worst Jew. He needed 12 months. You do 11 months, yeah. Yeah. If it needs the 12 months, it'll need 12 months, yeah. I have no idea. They don't consult me on those things. I can't tell you. <laughs> In other words, what the, the general answer to that is, look, what I'm going to do is we're going to stop over here, and next week we're going to be finishing chapter nine, ten, uh, 8, and it talks about a very, very important topic. Uh, but till now we talked about contaminating the action and the speech. The next topic is going to talk about what happens if you contaminated your actual brain. Your intellect has been contaminated. It's one thing to talk idle chatter, or even worse, gossip one thing to do bad things where your external forces have been introduced to the unholy but when your mind itself is corrupt and unholy that's a that's even a much bigger problem which we'll talk about next week it's a very fascinating topic actually but to answer your question about 
about reincarnation it says that every neshama has to go through. Most neshamas have to be reincarnated a few times because you have to do all the 613 mitzvahs and it's impossible to do them in one lifetime because you have certain mitzvahs that are for a man, certain mitzvahs that are for a woman, certain for a koyin, certain for a levi. So not all mitzvahs can be fulfilled by one person, by one life. Some don't apply, true. That's not, the, that's not reincarnation. That's a different thing here. Cleanse. Not to go back, to go into heaven, to, to, to enjoy paradise. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe it's finished already. Maybe it's, maybe not. We could be on our last... Yeah, it could be on their last journey. I think we all are. I think this generation is on the last journey. My friends, have a wonderful Purim. I want to remind everyone tomorrow night is Purim. Please join us for the Megillah. The next night is our Su'uda of Purim, the great feast, which is a mitzvah. If you didn't reserve yet to come, please come. What? That's on Thursday. If you, if you, if you, can, still, you can still reserve and be part of it. It's a fanta- fantastic situation. Can I tell you tomorrow is the other reason?